So the future is here. Uh, the way that we use the web and the way people are connecting to websites is, is changing, right? This is a picture of Liza Gardner making sweet device love to all the devices that she has. I know you guys all here probably have your iPad, your iPhone, your Android, whatever it is. But even this picture is kind of a misrepresentation of what's really happening. Most of these devices here are Apple devices. But people are, of course, using every kind of device all over the world. Mobile users are going to outnumber desktop users next year. So this is a thing that's going to happen. And mobile accounts for over half of all the traffic in Asia and Africa right now. In other countries like Africa, it's really common for people to check their um, bank accounts on their phone. So they're doing most of their bank transactions using their feature phone as opposed to going to an actual bank. So this has meant we have some new challenges for how we design for the web, how we design web applications, and applications are going to work on devices with different size screens. Take HTC, for example. HTC alone has 12 different screen size resolution combinations on Android. Okay, And HTC is one of the simpler Android lineups. And it doesn't even talk about Acer, Motorola, LG, Sony Ericsson, and the other 25 manufacturers of Android phones all with their own different screen size resolutions. And that's just Android phones. We're not talking about iPhones, Kindles, Blackberries, uh, maybe WebOS, but not really anymore. Nothing? OK. So <laughs> designing a different interface for every device is impossible, but not considering devices is a death sentence. And we're only barely starting to solve these problems. So hey, I'm from Zurb. Uh, my name's Matt. Zurb is an interaction design company and product company. We've worked with over 200 startups in the last 14 years to create over $1.5 billion in market capitalization. We've also worked with a lot of bigger companies that you may have heard of some of these. Uh, and I'm here to talk about responsive web design and some of the work that we've been doing on this. So what are your options for building a mobile product? Right? We need to be considering different devices. I think that's pretty obvious now. Um, so why responsive design? Why am I talking about this? Well, because it scales. We talked about the 10 different devices for the HTC. And that's just screens, anything with four corners, right? So we're not just talking about delivering your content to phones and to tablets and to desktops, but also TVs and anywhere else people are consuming your content. So anything with four corners, right? If it's small like this, like a phone, or big like this, like an iPad or a tablet, that's something we need to be considering. It's also orientations, rotations, locations, sound, sight, and more, right? I talked about the 10 different screen sizes for Android. That doesn't include the different orientations you can have on that device, which of course doubles that number. So the responsive web is the idea we can build one single code base and use it anywhere, right? We have this option of delivering our applications as a responsive web application, uh, and also potentially embedding these in a, an app application. So I'm sure you guys are familiar with like the, the Netflix app on the iPad. If we're doing responsive design to deliver content, we can do it just for a straight content website, but we can also do it for an application. So taking a website and embedding it inside an application to get access to more functionality on the device. But let's just worry about 10 or 12 things at once right now. So what does this mean for product design? Uh, now that we have all these different devices to think about when we're doing our web design, how is it going to change the way that we think about things? So like I said, Zurb is a product design company, and great design is all about iteration. This concept that great designers just kind of leap to a conclusion that they sit around on these fluffy chairs all day and all of a sudden they have this like aha moment. They're like, oh yes, I see exactly what the problem is and they solve it. That's totally a lie, right? Great design is all about iteration. The designers that I work with, they are never laying down. They're constantly up. They're doing sketching on uh, notep notepads with Sharpies. Or they're up at the whiteboards figuring out some concept, erasing it and doing something else and constantly getting feedback. It's this idea of iterating over and over again and getting feedback that produces really great results. So take these two gentlemen that created this you know, iconic piece of industrial design, the, the telephone, and you can see in the background all the different iterations that they went through, all the different prototypes to get to this great device that shaped the way that phones look, right? Does anyone know what this is besides a piece of wood? It's an iPhone, yes, that's right. This is the prototype for the original, um, the iPod actually, that Steve Jobs carried around in his pocket, right? If you think about the time that the iPod came out, the phones were all about really small phones. The Razor, flip phones, clamshells, look at something really small in our pocket. He really wanted to make sure that people would actually take a device this large and carry it around. So he took this block of wood and he put it in his pocket and he carried it around to make sure that it fit into his skinny jeans, right? And this is where the uh, original form factor of the, the iPod came in. And of course, past that, there were a number of iterations on the iPod to get it right. And the first one's kind of old and clunky with the big buttons. They got sexier and sexier. 
all the way to this device that I'll bet more than half of you have in your pocket right now. Uh, designers also like to work on juicers. So this is the juicer maybe your grandma had, maybe you have in the kitchen, I don't know. I'm not gonna judge you. This is a newer iteration on the juicer. It's a little cooler looking. This is a number of other iterations done on that juicer to come to this juicer that apparently juices much better than the other juicers and looks really cool, right? All the way to this, you know, crazy looking kind of alien thing. Maybe a step back, but very elegant design, the latest iteration of the juicer. This is Mountain Dew. This is Mountain Dew Code Red. Does anybody know what the latest iteration of Mountain Dew is? It's the Mountain Dew AM. Nothing? You guys are killing me here. Okay. <laughs> so that's iteration. Up until now, the way that most designers iterate on a website is by doing something like this, right? We go to Photoshop, we create a new canvas, and we do a design in Photoshop. We call somebody over, we say, hey, look at this design, what do you think? They have some feedback, we move some stuff around on it, we try it again, right? It's just not good anymore. This isn't the way that people consume content, right? Previously, we could have a fix with design for our web content, and that worked just fine because everybody was viewing our content on a screen that was pretty much the same width, or it was at least bigger than what we were trying to deliver. So as long as we delivered an experience that worked for the majority of devices, everything was great, and this wasn't a problem. So here, this is your content and it travels through all these different mediums to get to your user, right? They can view it on their TV, their phone, their desktop, and they get their content. And you don't have control over how they get that content anymore now that everybody's carrying these 20 or 15 devices around in their pocket. All right, so that's kind of a roundabout way to get to what is responsive prototyping, what are I'm talking about? So responsive prototyping is all about doing it in code, right? Uh, let's do it live, because this is the best way we're actually gonna be able to take our design and see what it looks like on a phone, what it looks like on a tablet, what it's gonna look like on a desktop. And that's doing a practical design review. Like I said, before, if we're just doing a design that's 960 pixels wide, then that's great. We only need to do a design review on that original design, show it to some people, and that's fine. But now we need to see what does it look like on a phone? What does it look like on an iPad? What does it look like on a desktop, right? Are the links gonna be clickable by a finger? Do I have to get my pinky out? Do I need some kind of special stylus to operate this website? And everywhere else that you can think of. Thinking about how your design works everywhere, not just on your 960 grid um, Photoshop layout. Which lets us iterate faster for multiple devices. By doing a prototype right in code, we can see that prototype right in front of us and iterate quickly for all the different devices. So, What's so great about responsive prototyping? Well, we can prototype for every device very quickly because we're using the, the 310 responsive prototyping that we're gonna talk about in just a second. And we're gonna cut down significantly on development because we're not building a different code base for each device. So we're gonna build just one code base that's gonna work across all these different devices. And we're gonna be ready for devices that don't exist yet, right? We don't know what the screen resolution is gonna be on the iPad next year. We don't know if we're gonna go to a double retina device that has twice the pixel density. We don't know what's gonna happen. So we need some new tools to the rescue, right? You guys are all developers, we all like tools, so I'm gonna talk about some tools and that's some fun stuff. But first, just a little bit of background on responsive design and what it really is. So how did we get to this uh, responsive design concept? Well, it actually happened pretty quickly. This guy named Ethan Marcotte wrote this article on a list apart where he explained responsive design, coined the term, and went down to three points of what does it mean to have actual responsive website. So it's three things. The first thing is a uh, fluid grid system. So if you guys were doing websites five or 10 years ago, you probably remember like fluid was a really big deal when monitors got really big. Everyone got really excited. They're like, oh, we have to do everything fluid so we can use every last pixel on this monitor, right? But ultimately it didn't really pan out because people didn't really care about using all the pixels on the monitor we were really just good enough with whatever we kind of fit in a 960 width, which is where you know, 960 came from. But for responsive, we have small devices. So this fluid grid becomes really important again, not only because we want to be able to shrink it down to a small device, but we just don't know what the width of the screen is going to be. So we want our fluid grid to be able to readjust our content to just fit on whatever the screen is, because on a phone that's really small or a phone that has 10 more pixels width, you want to be able to use all the pixels that you have. So that it looks like a nice seamless design that goes all the way to the edge of the device. Secondly, we need styles for media that don't worry about pixels. If we're gonna have a fluid grid and we're gonna have vastly different screen sizes like we do on a phone versus a desktop, all of our media needs to not care about pixels. So we need images that work on the big device and the small device, videos, all that good stuff. And we need media queries to selectively adapt the page. So I mean, one of the common conceptions about responsive is that responsive is fluid, right? Responsive is fluid, plus we're gonna use media queries to adjust things where they don't make sense. 
even with a fluid grid, a lot of designs on the desktop just aren't gonna make any sense on the mobile phone or on a tablet, right? And we need to selectively take certain things on the page and serve a different element or literally change the navigation. Um, when you go to a page on a browser, on a desktop, you want the navigation at the top. It makes a lot of sense, provides a really good hierarchy, right? When you're on a phone, the first thing you wanna get to is the content. If you have a big navigation on the top, that makes no sense. I have to see all this navigation stuff, I don't care. Show me the content, you gotta scroll past that. You probably want that on the bottom. So the key difference between responsive design and just fluid design is that fluid is just laying out everything in percentages, right, so that it flows to whatever size the container is. Responsive is that, plus we're gonna selectively make some changes. We're gonna say, hey, things are different on the phone than they are on the desktop, and we're gonna you know, selectively adapt the page. So there's three classes of devices, right? We have phones, tablets, and desktops. And in a lot of cases, tablets and desktops can be, are pretty much the same thing. The biggest difference, of course, is, is touch on a tablet versus a desktop but the screen is about big enough on a tablet that most of the affordances that work on the desktop will work on the tablet as well. All right, so that was the start of this whole responsive thing. When he wrote that article, there were no tools, he didn't have a grid in mind, he just said, this is how I think it's gonna be, right? So then the tools came after that. In, inside of our fluid grid and thinking about different devices, we also wanted to have um, tested things that we know are just gonna work. We wanna make sure our typography, our forms, and our buttons work really well across the different devices. Uh, obviously a button on a phone needs to be a lot larger than it does on a desktop if it's not big enough for you to actually be able to touch it and have a nice click area. So needing a toolkit like that is why we built Foundation 3. Foundation is a totally open source framework. I swear I'm not trying to sell you anything. Uh, we've been using this for our own internal client work for the past couple years under a number of different names, but this is the toolkit that we built. There's a couple other that are like that that we use to do responsive design. So this is what the doc page for Foundation looks like on a phone on a tablet, and then on a desktop. It's the exact same content across all three different devices, but as you notice, the navigation is a little bit different, so we are selectively changing the elements for the different devices. And frameworks like Foundation are what enable you to do rapid responsive prototyping. So we use Foundation to quickly build out new concepts and then test them across all three devices, and I'll show you some examples of that. Rapid responsive prototyping helps us make better products because we can prototype quickly, we can get ideas out there, we click with prototypes, and we can see how it works across different devices. So here's an example. This is a website that we did for Rebecca's Children's Services. Every year we do an event called Zerb Wired where we spend 24 hours building a new website and print material for a nonprofit. So we take applications and then the whole team comes into the office, there's about 20 of us, and we have maybe five or 10 volunteers come as well. And we work from 8 a.m. on Thursday until 8 a.m. on Friday. And at 8 a.m. on Friday, we launch a new website. Like, it goes out and that's it and we're done. There's no more messing with it. It's a pretty serious business. So, this is kind of how we did it. Like I said, we had 24 hours to do this whole thing. Um, these sites aren't crazy and complicated, but there are a lot of pages and we're doing a new visual direction for them. So, this year for Rebecca Children's Services, we did a whole bunch of sketching first. We probably did about 200 sketches for all the different pages, and we did this alongside with a nonprofit. So we got three or four designers in a room, and they were just banging out sketches, working with people from the nonprofit. What do you think about this for a homepage? Don't like it, throw it away, or recycle it. What do you think about this for the form page for the sign up, right? What do you think about this for a donate page? Going through a whole bunch of ideas really quickly, and coming up with just these really rough sketches of what all the major pages in the site are gonna be. So this gives us a rough idea what our site map is, and it just kind of shows us what's gonna be on each page. So these were the final pages. That's the home page in the top left. And we took these sketches, we wheeled it down to I think about 20 sketches, and we handed it to our coders, right? We had three guys, and they took, guys and gals, they took all of these sketches, and they coded them up in foundation, just as like a really rough prototype to get us something to work with. And this is what it looked in the foundation code. The, uh, there's only, I think, one line of presentational CSS on top of the foundation framework that is what creates that kind of um, box inlaid in the here unit on top. So this is laid out using the foundation grid. And if you guys are familiar with how a grid works, it's uh, laid out like this. Our grid has 12 columns that you can nest. It's a fluid grid, right, because we're doing responsive design and it has an arbitrary max width. So on really large devices, we're not gonna blow the grid all the way out, but if you wanna go full width, then you can just take one line of CSS and say max width auto, and it won't do that for you. It's modified by media queries for smaller devices, so like I said, things are different on a phone than they are on a desktop. I'll talk about that a little bit more later. And it looks like this. We have a div that's a row, 
and then we have two divs within it to create our, our columns. Three columns and nine columns equals 10 columns. Um, if you're familiar with the grid, this is pretty straightforward stuff. If you're not, this is just a great way for us to lay it out. So up here on the top, we've got a row with three columns on the left for our logo, nine columns on the right. Our hero piece across the middle is the full 12 columns, and then each of these pieces down below are four columns each. So in, in a grid, you have, you specify your columns and the grid automatically takes care of making sure each of your columns are spaced out. It has something called a, a gutter. So you can see next to each of those pieces down below, which is four column, four column, four columns, they're spaced out a little bit by the gutter that's all inside the grid. So all we're doing here is we're taking this row, splitting it up into three columns that are each four columns, and we're putting an image inside of that and that image is blowing up. Uh, I do apologize, the images here have the pixels written on them. That's the native size of the image that we're pulling from placeholder. It. But of course, that size of that image is gonna you know, resize based on whatever the layout of the page is. So the images are contained inside each one of those columns. As the column shrinks or expands, the image is gonna shrink or expand with the column. So the rows look like this. Like I said, they have an arbitrary max width, so they won't get bigger than um, what that max is specified to be. And then columns inside have that gutter in between them. So here we have our three columns and our nine columns. When we add more, more rows on top of each other, the uh, columns, are, of course, are fixed by percentages, and then the height of each row is determined by the content inside of that row. So we can keep stacking a bunch of rows on top of each other to lay out the page how we'd like. And we can also nest rows. So for more complex layouts, we can nest a row inside of a column to split it up even more. So here we've got another, um, I think that's 10 and two columns. And then below that, another row with four and six columns, or four and eight. So here's another page. This one is laid out entirely using the grid and uh, just the, the base foundation elements. So on the left, we have our row with our content in it. It's got eight columns and we've nested a number of rows inside of that. Each of those embedded rows is two columns on the left and then 10 columns on the right. So you can very really easily do these um, uh, common layouts, like I want image on the left, content on the right. You can put this stuff together very quickly using the, using the grid. So we've talked about this being responsive. So when you take this grid layout and you look at it on a mobile device, we simply take the columns and we stack them on top of each other. So this is the, uh, the default behavior. So when I go into my phone, everything just gets stacked. It's pretty common when you're on a phone to view things in this kind of linear fashion. If you think about how you're viewing your email, you're used to scrolling up and down, right? Better just present the content on top and let someone scroll through it than making it really smart and hard to read, small and hard to read, and having to pinch to zoom in between all of it. Um, we also have this, this concept of uh, source ordering. So when we take these columns and we put them on top of each other, you may not like the order that they come in, right? Maybe you had your navigation on the left and your content on the right. When we stack it, now you get your navigation on top, which of course is kind of a bummer. So we have this concept, these classes you can add to your columns. It's called, the concept is called source ordering. The implementation we have is called push and pull. So you can say, I wanna take these seven columns and push them to the left and these three and pull them to the right. What it does is on a desktop, it will flip the order they're displayed in. So we can actually display our markup in the order that we want it to be seen on a phone or a tablet, but then on the desktop, we can rearrange it to display it in a different fashion. This is really good for uh, screen readers, where for a screen reader, you want the first content they see in the actual body of the content to be whatever your content is, right? Read me the headline, read me the article. Source ordering lets you lay out your content in the way you want it to be seen by a screen reader or by a phone, and then it adjusts it to be displayed differently on a desktop. If you actually want to keep your columns next to each other, we also have a mobile grid that's four columns wide. So this way, on a mobile device, I may actually want things to stay next to each other, right, embedded in a, in a column. I may have a column where I want to keep everything next to each other. I'll use the mobile grid, I'll put the mobile classes on there, and it'll keep them all next to each other. The classes for the grid look like this. One column, two columns, three columns. Two columns offset by four, if you want to take your columns and push them over to the side, or eight columns centered, if you've got columns you just want to center right inside of that row. So let's go a little bit deeper into the grid and what makes our grid different from other grids. Uh, so when we went from foundation two to three, we changed the way that our grid is built to be um, similar to what Golden Grid does with theirs to make it more of an easily customizable grid. So the problem with customizing most grid layouts with the gutters is that you specify your columns like this. So we have our column, we're gonna float it, uh, min height and position relative to keep things laid out correctly. 
and then margin left is what actually creates the, the gutter on side of the column, right? That means when we specify each of the column widths, we have to specify them like this. One column is 4.3%, two columns is 13%, but this doesn't actually add up to 100%. What we have to do is we have to figure out for each column, you know, if I have one column here, how much of a gutter do I need, right? Because the gutter size is fixed, how wide should the column be? Because there's only gonna be one gutter to the left of it. So you can't change the size of your gutter on your grid without changing all of these column declarations every time that you do that. So if you can imagine you pull this grid down and you don't like the gutter, you want a larger gutter, you have to update all these different declarations, right? So you either have to have some kind of preprocessor like SAS or you have to rewrite all this stuff and do the math to figure it out, which isn't crazy, but it's kind of a pain in the butt. What you really want is something like this, where one column is 8.33%, which all adds up to 100% when you do it, so that you never have to mess with these declarations. You can just edit your gutter size and then everything's good to go. You'd love to write something like this, where it's just like padding 015, that's my gutter, uh, don't muck with it. But the problem with, this, with doing it like this is, of course, that padding is not part of the width of your column, so this messes up all the calculations, right? Our padding is not included in the width of the column, so this doesn't work. However, you can do something cool like this, which is a border box sizing. So what this does, if you say for every element using the star selector, I want to use box sizing, border box, this takes you back in time to the days of IE6 and the border box model, where padding is actually included in the width of your elements. So it turns out this may not have been such a bad thing as we thought after all. Um, Paul Irish has a really good article on his blog about why border box sizing may make more sense than the current model that we're doing. So by putting our browser into this mode, we can specify our columns by just having the width they add to 100%, and then we just have our gutters specify exactly as they are. You can modify the gutters to your heart's content, and the other column will still get changed at all. And here's what the full declaration looks like. This is supported everywhere except for IE7, ironically. Uh, it was the default mode in IE6, they dropped it in IE7, and then they brought it back in IE8. All modern browsers support it, uh, except for IE7. And there's the link to Paul Irish's article, which is very good. So let's talk about images. So like we said, in a responsive design, your images need to be able to scale up or down based on whatever size your column is. This means they have width like whatever. So you don't know what the width is actually gonna be when it's presented because it depends on the devices you're looking at. Because the responsive prototype is all about giving up control, right? So this creates some interesting challenges. Um, images in responsive design, they have to be able to scale for different devices. So this means you need to serve a really large image that's gonna work on the desktop, which will also scale down to phones. The problem, of course, is now on your mobile phones, you're serving an image that's much larger than it needs to be, because that same image is being scaled up or down. And there's really not a lot of great solutions to this problem yet. It can either be large enough to handle heavy load, right? Or you can swap it out with something like Scott Gell's response to image solution. So uh, the solution is cool. It requires you to go in and do a little bit of Apache configuration and some other hackery. It gets the job done. Um, if you're serving the large image for the desktop and you just want to use the exact same image on the phone, the cool thing about that is it is a large image, but you're already supporting the retina devices, right? because the new phones and the iPads have retina devices, double pixel density, if you're having a lot of really crisp looking elements on the page, and then you have something that's not the right density, it looks a little bit muddy. Apple has a really cool solution on apple.com right now. If you go to the apple.com website on a retina laptop, and you refresh the page with the cache cleared, you'll see that the big like glossy image shows up a little bit muddy, and then it snaps to the crisp one. So what they're doing is, in the source code, they're serving up this single pixel density image and they're using JavaScript to detect, okay, is this a double, is it a retina device or is it a regular device? If it's the retina one, it'll load in the high density image. So it looks really nice and sharp, right? Stuff on the retina device, retina screens, um, they, they do look a little muddy, so it's kind of a weird problem. There's the link to the uh, Scott Jellicott's image solution. And in the latest web kit, there is an attribute that you can specify to serve a different image for double pixel density Im um, devices, right? So for your retina laptops. Other than that, there's really not a great way to serve the different images. Um, if you're using anything in SVG, SVG stuff works great. Uh, also, icon fonts are an awesome way to serve images that look great across all different devices. So typography works really well across all different devices. So if you guys are familiar with using icon fonts, you can take an icon font, which is a font, but instead of letters, there's all these different icons that you want to embed, right? 
the cool thing about this is they're vector images, so they look really crisp on any device. They're really small, um, unless you're loading some huge font library, which you don't use all of them, which is kind of a bummer. But they're going to scale up or down for any device. And you're also able to change the color of them using all the same CSS properties that you'd use to change the color of like, a, like text, right? You can also apply some of the cool transforms, like um, you can put text shadow on them, you can blur them, you can do some pretty neat stuff to create some cool effects for different images. Uh, if you don't want to serve an entire icon library, it's great for prototyping. You can use one of the really big ones you can download. There's a number of free font icon libraries. Um, but if you want to serve something really light, you probably actually need to go through, take all of your individual images and put them into your own icon font and generate that and push that out. So this is kind of like the new sprites, right? There's still some pain here, but you get a lot of gain out of it. Typography forms and buttons, again, in our foundation, we're trying to think through all these problems. How do they work on different devices? You don't have to worry about it. Um, so we just have classes specify buttons. This is an anchor tag with a small blue button class, and you get a small blue button. Large blue button, you can toss some radius on that with a radius class, or you can make it nice and put a little bit of shine on it, right? These buttons all uh, have a certain width. The size is based on the class that we show there, but on a mobile device, they run the full width of the column so that they're really easy to click. So going back to this example, Rebecca showed the services. It took us about two hours to go from these sketches to the actual uh, coded up wireframe on foundation. And then about seven hours after that to take this code base and get to the actual fully done design, right? The cool thing about foundation is that it really has no styling in it outside the box. We're literally just using it as like a bare bones wireframing tool. So there's really nothing to override and there's nothing to throw away later. So when we use it, we build everything on top of it. We don't just toss it and do a new thing. It's the foundational CSS, the grid stays the same, the elements stay the same. We just add all the presentational CSS on top of that, of course, in a separate style sheet. It puts together the full design of the site. And you can see what the site looks like on the desktop, on the tablet, and then on the phone. So what's next? Uh, what are we looking for to come next in, in responsive design? Well, better media support. Uh, responsive images, like I said, they're still a big problem. There's not great support across different browsers. And unless you're doing some really big hacky JavaScript thing, the best solution you have right now is to serve a really low, kind of like the apple.com hack, serve a really low uh, resolution image when that loads up, use JavaScript to detect the screen size, and then snap in the larger one. So we're kind of going back to like the old days, the progressive GIFs that would kind of like load like You guys remember those? For Apple.com? For Apple what are you saying? Oh, what do you mean? I don't think so. You can see the regular stuff that has like sensor projection screen and then you like have the connection to the one that has the screen. Like intentionally cut your connection? Yeah. We'll talk about this afterwards. Okay. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh. Okay. <laughs> the, uh, the picture tag, which will hopefully come around pretty soon in the spec, which will hopefully let us do cool stuff, like serve different sizes images for different resolution images for different size devices. Um, and then the prevalence of SVG, right? So SVG is pretty decent support. It's not support everywhere. But if you have images that you can do with SVG, it's another option. Again, you're dealing with vector images that are going to be really small. They're going to look good on all the different devices. It's going to be super crisp, even on those um, the, the retina devices. So like, I don't know if you guys have seen, there's some pretty cool libraries. Uh, there's like a JS library that does a little spinner that's to generate using SVG graphic. So the SVG stuff looks super crisp on every single device. And like I said, I talked about icon fonts already. Better, more advanced frameworks. Um, new CSS properties like box sizing. So I talked about box sizing. Most of you guys probably aren't using this. There's other implications for adding box sizing. It may break other things that you're doing. So as more people start to adapt box sizing, it may become a thing, and stuff may just kind of work in box sizing mode. Uh, there's been a lot of cool thought about typography, including vertical rhythm and, and scale. So vertical rhythm is how your page is, is laid out, right? You have your headers, you have your content, and how all that stuff is spaced out between each other is called the vertical rhythm of the page. And uh, designers are kind of arguing now about how it should be laid out. What are the like, exact ratios? If I have content that's related, how far should that spacing be compared to content that's unrelated? So there's a lot of good thought in the community about how we should be laying out our pages. And this stuff's going to be built into these frameworks so that when I lay out 
my, my markup, it's already kind of done in the, in the CSS. Um, we use vertical rather than foundation. It's based on the, the golden ratio, or the golden rule, golden ratio. It's make sure that all the things space correct. So if you're using our headers, our paragraph tags, everything looks really pretty when you lay it out. It's got a really nice sort of rhythm of the page. And preprocessors like SAS and less. Um, we use SAS for foundation. We're huge fans of it. It makes life a lot easier. If you're doing stuff like the box sizing, you just say, hey, I want box sizing on. It'll generate the declaration for every single browser, put the prefixes on it. Um, it does some really neat stuff. But of course, you need to do the work of having your preprocessor running and generating your code as you're going through it. We don't usually pimp products by Adobe, but I'm actually going to say that the Adobe Edge stuff is actually looking pretty cool. If you guys haven't checked this out, I keep an eye on it. They got some neat stuff coming. Edge Reflow is like a Dreamweaver that doesn't suck for responsive. It's, uh, it's really neat. So it's the idea of you, you lay stuff out on the page. And I think I got a screenshot of it here. Like this, is it this one? Yes, this is Reflow. So you lay stuff out on the page, and you have controls on the left. So you say like, hey, here's a box. It can take up this percentage of the page. And you can use this little slider, and you can say, scroll between different device sizes, and it'll show you how your design actually looks on different devices. So it's like a WYSIWYG editor for responsive stuff, and they've actually kind of solved some of these interaction problems. It's still not done. We played with it. It was looking like it could be a thing. So that could be kind of exciting. Um, also, Edge Inspect, it was previously called Shadow when it was in its beta release. It's, uh, it packages up one of those open source libraries that lets you have a inspector embedded on all of your different devices. So what you do is you take the Adobe Inspect agent, you install it on all of your devices, you take them and you like mount them on the wall or something, and then your control device, you go through your pages and it updates all of their devices. So you can see what it looks like across all the different devices. If you see something that's broken, you can actually inspect the markup on any of your other devices, which is pretty cool because there's no inspector on most mobile phones. So what's next for foundation? Um, we are going to do a uh, new plugin called Clearing. If you're familiar with foundation, we have a, a modal plugin right now called Reveal that really kind of isn't great for light boxes. So we don't want you to have to hack our modal plugin. It doesn't look great. It wasn't built for images. We're going to add um, this new thing called Clearing. We have uh, like an image slider called Orbit that also really isn't a modal experience. So we're kind of adding this, this third thing called Clearing. Um, and Clearing has two different ways to use it. You can attach it to a UL. So you drop a UL on the page, give it the class Clearing, and we will take it and display it like this. So it's going to display the thumbs of different things. It's kind of for like an image gallery if you want to show some images. And uh, on the mobile device, it will show them large like that with thumbs in the bottom. And the desktop, it'll show just little individual thumbs. Or you can say Clearing 4-Up. We'll constrain it to 4-Up, and then we'll stack them below that. Or you can just say, hey, just show four of them, only show four of them. You can fire it from a single anchor. So if you've got like a hero piece in the top of your page and you want to fire the clearing, like the, the slideshow presentation, you can just attach data clearing equals banner. That'll fire the, uh, the clearing that's attached down there. So it'll look something like this. And when you click on it, it'll go into this kind of full screen experience where we're showing the image there and the thumbs in the bottom. On a tablet, it'll be very similar. And then on the phone, they'll just show the images one at a time, and you'll be able to swipe through them when you're actually in the clearing presentation mode. So we are going to be launching that in October. So yeah, that's all I've got. I'm happy to answer any questions about responsive design or whatever else you guys want to talk about. And thanks for hanging out.